low growth, low productivity, and stagnation. And it's true really in every part of the world. It's a matter of degree, some places more than others. But even in the United States, um, we are in a very low growth, uh, low productivity era, uh, very significant. It's hovering around 1%. Um, work that we've done at the U.S. Council on Competitiveness uh, really articulates that we have to have at least 3% growth in order to maintain our standard of living. Uh, new President of the United States is calling for 3.5%. So growth is what everything's about. And of course the productivity that enables that. And the U.S. Council on Competitiveness, we, we're very proud. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary um, in December. And, you know, we're, we're a unique organization in that our members, um, our CEOs from every sector of the economy who join with our university presidents and labor leaders and national lab directors to put together a national action agenda to how to drive productivity, standard of living, and the success of our enterprises in the global marketplace. And while lots of the issues and challenges you know, have changed over 30 years, the, the core metric is still growth and productivity. So one of the reasons that I think we need to put all this in context, and it's uh, you know, easy to say this, but it's hard to live it, and that is that the whole world is really undergoing tremendous turbulence and transition and disruption and transformation. And it's really because we are transitioning between two industrial ages, the 20th century age of production and services has completely disappeared in terms of where the future is. Um, we are now seeing uh, the disruption of industries that we couldn't even imagine a few years ago would be in trouble, whose business models are constantly being challenged. I mean, a few years ago, it was all the talk about you know Uber and taxi drivers. Well, now it's you know autonomous vehicles. So we're in this rapid, rapid change um, of transformation, and it's created, as we heard yesterday, you know, tremendous political anxiety, political shifts, uh, social changes, uh, as well as many on the, the national security front as well. Now, um, as we grapple with this tremendous transition and, and transformation, there's one kind of central feature that is not going to change, it's only going to accelerate, and that is this uh, digitalization. And we're really now in the third phase of it. Um, and we heard yesterday that Europe tends to be a little bit behind on the digitalization of its economy. But that notwithstanding, everything is impacted by this. In fact, um, global supply chains are ever more closely integrated through digital uh, systems. Uh, the discovery of knowledge, the commoditization of knowledge, I mean, it's interesting how, when you think of how long it used to take for a new scientific discovery to get into the marketplace, now it's really happening at warp speed because of the democratization of knowledge and information. Uh, it, a year or so ago, uh, people were still talking about the internet of things, the industrial internet. Uh, it's really the internet of everything now. Uh, energy's being delivered in bits and bytes. So this whole merger of the physical and the virtual world has really had profound implications for growth and productivity. Um, you know, this is happening, of course, through sensors and networks of networks. Uh, we like to say in the U.S. we have a data tsunami, tremendous value of data. I'll just give you one example. I had the opportunity a week ago to visit a fabulous company. I don't know how many of you have heard of it, Snap-on Tools. It's over 100 years old, and they make uh, tools really for industrial uses, but also all the mechanics, anybody who repairs things, airports, they all use Snap-on tools. They have now thousands of patents. It's tremendously innovative, but its core business is making these tools. And I was out visiting their factory, and now so much of the repair work is all automated with sensors, and they have more data than any company in the world on all the service issues related to every car model. Just think of that. They're sitting on, it's all coming from the mechanics and the shop floors. And so an issue is, I mean, they know more about what's going on with a new model of a Tesla than probably Tesla does because they are repairing them at the shop floor. So the value of their data is, is really more valuable than the tools they make. 
So that's part of the transformation on the IT space that is absolutely massive in scale and will not go away. You know, we, we are now really not in the autonomous future. Autonomy's here. Uh, the chairman of the U.S. Council on Competitiveness is the CEO of John Deere. They have autonomous tractors. They'd have them for a long time. Pittsburgh's now becoming a place in the world where autonomy is being uh, uh, rolled out. But all of this, you know, depends upon the self-learning, the deep learning, the intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the uh, convergence of assembly of new materials. All of these things in this IT space and software and materials is really changing our world. And of course, this, we can talk about this later, how this impacts jobs, the automation, everything is a very important topic as well. And then, of course, we see in the life sciences with synthetic biology and the ability now with CRISPR technology to modify every component of a human genome, every living thing, this technology has also completely moved around the world and it's going to change the fundamentals of the pharmaceutical biotechnology industry. And I'll mention agriculture because here, of course, agriculture is a very important historical, traditional, and future part of the economy because of the data and the IT, we now have the ability to manage and illuminate every component of agriculture from the seed level. So the seed becomes the actual unit of the electrons in precision agriculture. So, you know, all of this is enabled by people. And so turning to Greece, and where is Greece in all of these uh, convergences of what I call the digital, the biotech, the nano, and the cognitive revolutions that are colliding and converging. Well, Greece has very smart, highly educated people. That is a huge asset. I would say that it's the parallel to having the data in the other example I gave. And these people and the creativity and the education need to be unleashed and harnessed. Greeks need to be part of innovation networks, they need to be part of the innovation creator class, the disruptor class, the provider class, and the user class. So let's look at competitiveness. Competitiveness is really an integrated system. It's not just about tax policy, it's not about just R&D, it's not about skilled training, it's how they all come together in a system that optimizes itself for value creation. So I'm not going to say anything about the macroeconomic issues here. I, I know there are talks underway in Athens, and I think that will eventually be resolved, hopefully sooner than later, and that debt overhang and all those things will go. But in the meantime, my recommendation is to Greece is to move out on all fronts and not let that be the albatross to hold you back. Um, if you look at the structure of a competitiveness strategy that I think would be very valuable here, it's really got four parts. It's the talent, it's the technology, and that includes many of these assets. It's the investment, and we've heard about investment disincentives or incentives and barriers, and then the infrastructure. Infrastructure being both the soft and the hard. So as I said, what is Greece's number one export? It's not good. People. You're exporting your most important value of people. You don't want to do that. So, a couple surveys I found some data on. Um, half of Greece's employed people, about 40%, want to leave. 67% of young Greek adults want to immigrate. Their future, young people want to leave. And yet, we all know through history, and even here we see this, Greeks are entrepreneurs, they're risk takers. There is a vibrant startup economy here in Greece, but when you look at the data, it's very inward, it's not outward. A lot of it is in restaurants, in retail, it's domestic, it's not global. And when I mentioned this to Greek colleagues, they said, but we're a small country. And my answer to that is, so what? Israel's a small country, Taiwan's a small country, Singapore, the Nordics, very small populations. So it's New Zealand, another example. So the size of the population does not have anything to do with where the markets are. The entrepreneurship and the innovation has to be developed in a way that from the get-go, you're looking at global markets. And then the other thing that's happening is, pardon? 
Okay, the other thing that, that's very important is that when companies are ready to scale, they want to scale outside of Greece. So a couple things from the OECD on Greece's metrics. Bottom share in public investment in R&D, rock bottom in business R&D, rock bottom in partnering between universities and industries, and rock bottom in venture capital. So what needs to be done? Well, on the talent side, I've said something on that. On the technology side, there's some very, very fine research institutions here. Democritos, Forth, CERF, these are assets. Certainly on the infrastructure, the regulatory regime is crippling. I think you need a moratorium and a, really a strategy to get rid of these regulations and go through the process to reduce them radically, absolutely radically. And then also on the um, technology side, and this is very important, Greece can play a major role in artificial intelligence, in autonomy, in cybersecurity, huge areas. I know a company where all the software work in an AI startup is being done here in Greece. Get a national initiative around that and team with the partners in the world. So in short, Greece needs a 21st century reindustrialization strategy. And when I say industrialization, I'm talking about the industries and services of the 21st century and leapfrog. Don't compete around taxes and regulation. Compete around your innovation capacity and use your tremendous asset of people. So I'll just conclude with a great quote from one of our uh, very famous heroes in the United States, and I'm very involved in the Navy, so I, I love to quote something from the US Navy. And that's uh, John Paul Jones, who was a Revolutionary War sea captain. And his quote is, it seems to be a law of nature, inflexible and inexorable, that those who will not risk cannot win. So the time is here to be risk takers. Thank you.